Do let us start. So we can start. Uh, so of course, we, let us start with asking: Is the uh, let me recapitulate the previous lecture? Uh, we started by uh, you know defining these operators A I, which are addition operators. So we said you add at site i and relax. Then we showed that these operators commute with each other. And then, oh, before that there was a matrix delta i j, which specifies how the toppling occurs. You know, under toppling the under toppling at site i, delta i i is the number of particles lost and minus delta ij is the number of particles gained at site j. So this matrix specifies the toppling fully. And um, then uh, we showed that a i product for all i, a i to the power delta i j is identity because if you add I, delta i i particles at site i, that will correspond to one particle at added at all the neighbors in the simplest setting. Okay, and then using this group, uh, this operator structure, we showed that the set of all the a i's form a group which looks like a torus in d dimensions. And then we said that uh, the operators A i can be simultaneously diagonalized. And so you get there are eigenvectors, which will be slightly changed notation now. There is phi, eigenvectors which can be labeled by phi 1, phi 2, phi n such that A i phi 1, phi 2, phi n is equal to e to the power i phi i phi 1, phi 2, phi n. So, these are simultaneous eigenvectors of all the A i and right now we do not know what is the value of phi i. So, phi i satisfy these equations twice pi delta i j phi j is equal to twice, sorry, twice pi m i for all i. And so you can choose any set of integers m i and invert this set of equations and you get a once allowed set of phi i and then that set of phi i will give you a solution to the eigenvalue problem. Okay. Uh, so, what are these vectors? See the eigenvalues we have determined, but the vectors, what are they? These are the eigenvalues of the translator operator on the torus. Because A i's are translation operators on the torus. These are eigenvectors of the translation operator on a torus. So, they are easily determined. They will be exponential i k y i, where y are the displacements along the torus. Is 
is this point clear because I am sort of writing, saying something without writing anything on the board and I am hoping that that is good enough. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, not Very good. So now the point is this. So we said that uh, we start with all possible states which are 4 to the power n, but some subset of these states are these recurrent states. And then most of the discussion we will restrict ourselves to the recurrent states because the other states do not come into picture, they do not matter. So we do not worry about them. The group structure is only valid for the recurrent states. When you restrict yourself to the recurrent states, then each a i has an inverse. If you do not restrict yourself to recurrent states, then you can have it such that this, you know, there is some state here, this is a i, this is some other state, this is a i and this is some other state. You know, we drew it like this. So, at this point, there is no a i inverse because two things are coming in and only one is going out. So, if I know this one, I do not know which state I should apply so that I get a i. There is no unique inverse. Okay? But we want a unique inverse, so we get rid of this state and then in the restricted set of states on the ring, there is a unique inverse. Okay. Any other question? Yes, sir. Is the orbit of the a operator a i? For instance, a one huh? n times. Yeah. You could do the same applying a two. Yeah. And you could do the same. I, I'm asking you applying uh, pattern order of a one and a two. For instance, a one, a two, a one, a two. Yeah. You will always get. Yeah. Uh, mm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in our argument, we are using only a one and orbits of a one. But yeah, you can ch choose some other operator. Oh, because these are under A1, but you use some other operator A2. A2 can take you a state from one state to some other state. Okay. Okay. So I think. Um, hmm. I think it's nice to work these out in a um, rather trivial problem. See, this, uh, this structure appears to be rather abstract and complicated and I am trying to show you that there is nothing very abstract about it. So, let us take these very trivial sand pile. There are only two sides, one, two and the rule we said yesterday was that th four particles, if they are there, then they topple, three of them leave and one of them goes to the right. Okay. So, uh, this one I can do sort of like this. Start with a state which is 0, 0. 0, 0 is the height at this side. Mm, height 1, height 2, 0, 0. I apply A1. What will I get? 1, 0. Then I apply A1 again. 2, 0. Then I apply A1 again. 3, 0. Then I apply A1 again. Zero one. Apply a one again. One one. Two one. Three one. And then zero two. One two. Two two. Three two. And then. 0, 3, and then 1, 3, and then 2, 3, right, and then 3, 3, and then 1, 0. So, you get a loop that is the operation of A1. What is the operator A2 doing on this? 
So, we kind of realize that the 0, 0 state is transient, and it will not show up in the recurrent structure. But anyway, under operator A2, what happens to this one? Goes to 0, 1. 0, 1 is here. I should use a different color. And 1, 1 will go to 0, sorry, 0, 1 will go to 0, 2. And 0, 2 will go to 0, 3. And 0, 3 will go to 1, 0. <coughs> so, it will come here. So, it, and this will go to 1, 1. Okay. It traverses the same orbit, but now four steps at a time. But since 4 is co-prime to 15, it will actually travel the whole loop again and you will get a period or orbit of period 15 again. Okay. So, in this case, uh, we get A2 is equal to A1 to the power 4. Applying A2 once is the same as applying A1 four times because, you know, I jump four steps when I go to A2. <coughs> And vice versa, A1 is equal to A2 to the power 4. So, it is straightforward. And the other stuff is just a trivial extension of this mm, result. It is not more complicated than this. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now what we want to find is the number of dis different solutions of phi I can construct. Number of distinct solutions to phi i, the set phi i, which is phi 1, phi 2, phi together. Okay? So, we said that you can take these m i and give them any values and each integer will give rise to a uh, solution because phi i is equal to twice pi delta inverse times m and this is i j m j. Okay. So, if I look at the values of phi i in n dimensional space, there will be some points. It is very hard for me to draw n dimensional space, but schematically it looks like this. I don't know, I drew something. <laughs> so, it forms a periodic lattice. The set of allowed values of phi i will form a periodic lattice in the n dimensional phi space because it is a sum of basis vectors. You know, m times m is equal to summation m j e j in that m dimensional space. So, there are some basis vectors and uh, it forms a um, big lattice of these. If you in the phi dimension, phi space, you take a space and then add a unit vector, you get another allowed point, another allowed point and so on. You can do it in all this. Okay. So, what is the, what are the unit vectors? They are just these. Okay. So, what is the volume of the unit cell in this um, phi space? So, 
so so we say that values of phi form a lattice in n dimensions okay so i guess this result is i assume is known to everybody and i know that it is not but once i say it maybe you will accept the fact that it is actually true so if i take three vectors v1 v2 v3 in three space which are tilted in some way but they are linearly independent but they are some vectors what is the volume of the parallel pipette formed with these vectors how many of you know the answer it is some standard stuff taught in three dimensional geometry one only one no 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 please the question is given a parallel pipette whose uh, i sit at one vertex i look at the vectors in that there are these three vectors v1 v2 v3 what is the volume of the parallel pipette in terms of these three vectors louder okay so it is called the box product all of you have seen it perhaps so the volume is equal to determinant of v11 v12 v13 v21 v22 v23 v31 v32 v33 plus minus because the volume has to be for the moment volume is positive the determinant may be positive or negative depending on how you calculate it so the volume with the will be the modulus of the determinant okay uh, is now this result seems okay it's immediately generalized to n dimensions if you have an n dimensional parallel pipette all you got to do is to take v1 the vectors v11 v12 v13 sorry this is vector 1 this is vector 2 this is vector 3 you write vector vn form a determinant and that gives you the volume of the parallel pipette in n dimensions as a trivial check if i if one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others then the parallel pipette volume becomes zero okay also if i take up you know suppose i have these two vectors v1 v2 it forms this parallel pipette but i take a different vector v1 prime is equal to v1 plus v2 and form a parallel pipette with v1 prime and v2 parallel pipette form parallel pipette formed with v1 prime v2 okay the volume of the new parallel pipette is the same as the old one right there is a geometrical construction because v1 prime is this the parallel pipette with v1 prime will be this one but it's equal to this one okay it's clear okay so very good so the volume of the unit cell in the phi space is the uh, is equal to so the it's equal to this stuff so it's 2 pi to the power d determinant of delta inverse because these are the unit vectors no unit vectors are delta inverse i yes sir how do we know that i i is a linearly independent uh if they are not then the volume will be zero i guess it follows no 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 it follows that the volume will be zero then my answer will fail and i suppose there will be something wrong with the original problem what happens with the original problem is that in this case there are some sides or there is some some problem say that 
things keep on toppling forever and there is no steady state. Okay? So, in cases where you are guaranteed that from every side there is some probability that particle can leave, then you can show that the eigen, there is no zero eigenvalue possible of delta. I will not give that proof here. Okay? So, so, this is the volume of the unit cell. So, but we said that if you have a value of phi i, then phi i plus 2 pi gives you the same physical state because we are actually looking at eigenvalues of e to the power i phi i. So, the number of distinct eigenvalues of phi is the number of points. So, number of distinct vectors, eigenvectors is equal to volume. So, it is the number of points in the cube minus pi to plus pi to the power d. So, I take, I have with my phi dimension, this phi space and uh, you know there are all these points inside, but there is a unit cell minus pi to plus pi in d dimensions, I cannot draw it very well, okay. But uh, all the points outside these are equivalent to points inside, so I only need to know what the volume of points inside the unit, this pi cubed. 2 pi cubed minus pi to plus pi to the power d. Okay? So, what is that? That is the volume of the cube divided by volume of the unit cell is equal to volume of cube divided by volume of unit cell. Okay? So, luckily the 2 pi cancel of course, they should cancel and then volume of the unit cell is determinant of delta inverse and so this is determinant of delta, which is nice because delta was an integer matrix and the answer is some de number which is a clearly an integer. All the 2 pi's which came in the middle have cancelled, yes sir. number of distinct solutions of phi i. So, we counted how many points fall within minus pi plus pi to the power d. We said these are equal to 2 pi to the power d divided by volume of the unit cell. Volume of the unit cell was this and so this number is determinant of delta. Okay? So, there are that many distinct points. Now, what happens is that you can actually prove all these results from the definition. That is what we are doing most of the time, but proving everything in gory detail is very tedious even for this um, simple problem. So, some of the results I will state and you will prove them yourself because they are easy to prove, but I will not prove everything here. So, if you force me, I will sit down with you and I will give you the proof for every statement I make. Okay? So, here uh, it turns out that this number of distinct eigenvectors is actually equal to the, the dimension of the space I work in, which is the number of recurrent states. We will prove this one actually. So, this number of distinct eigenvectors is we will show. this number of eigenvectors, distinct eigenvectors, distinct, right now we have shown distinct eigenvalues is equal to determinant of delta, uh, equal to 
the number of recurrent states. Okay, so now the dimension of states, phase space I am working in is the number of recurrent states because all the other states I throw away. The number of recurrent states is determinant delta. Number of eigenvalues I have found is determinant delta. So now I have counted everything, there is nothing missing and everything is in good shape. I only have to prove this part that the number of recurrent states is equal to determinant of delta. We have only shown the number of eigenvectors of something or the other is determinant of delta. Okay? So, very good. So, that is what I want to do next. Yes? Question? Okay. So, recurrent and transient configurations. So, I start with my basic send file again. And uh, we construct some configuration with various heights, no? 1, 2, 0, 3, whatever. I give you a configuration and I ask you, is this recurrent or is this transient? Can we t look at that configuration and tell whether it is recurrent or transient? What is the test? to distinguish between recurrent and transient configurations. And so now I give you a test. And there is a, mm, so, so in a recurrent state, cannot occur. Okay. Proof. Suppose you start with the configuration of the pile in which there are two adjacent sites and both of them are not zero now. Then can I keep add anything anywhere and do it such that both of them become zero? You are allowed to put any other starting configuration anywhere and you come to this and produce a state in which both are zero. The answer is it is not possible. Why? Because whatever you do from outside, you can only add particles into this and then you can topple particles. When you topple particles, this suppose you want to produce a zero here, then there should be a four here. If there is an eight, you reduce it to four and then four has to be reduced to zero. But if 4 has to be reduced to 0, then it will topple 1 and be make 1 here. Right? So, if you had made 0 here, then this would have become 1. If now I want to make this 0, but if I try make to make this 0, I will have to add something here, but that will make this one 1. Try as you might, you cannot produce two adjacent zeros if they are not there in the beginning. Okay. So, that is a provides a simple test. You look at the configuration. If somewhere you find two adjacent zeros, that is a transient configuration. Throw it out. Okay. So, um, very good. But now, I can, yes. But now, I can um, sort of add to this and cannot occur. Proof. 
is the same as before. If I want to produce a one he, zero here, if I want to produce a one he, uh, zero at both ends, both of them will throw in one to the middle. So we'll make it a two. If you want to change two to one, then you will have to make it into five and then throw out four, but then they will produce something at the end. Okay. So if you want to make this thing into a zero, then you will throw something here. Now, if, if this has to become a one, then it should have been zero before. But two zeros are not allowed in a recurrent configuration. So, zero, one, zero is also not allowed. Okay? So, this cannot occur. And this cannot occur. And, you know, you use the same method to prove that this cannot occur. And, um, I don't know. 0, 0, 0, 2 cannot occur. Because each will throw a 1, so it will be at least 3. Um, okay? Um, all right. So, but, so these things are called forbidden subconfigurations. Forbidden subconfigurations. they are not allowed to occur in the recurrent state. Okay? And there are sub-configurations because these are just finite set of sites and they can not occur anywhere on the big lattice, whatever size you have. Okay? So, now, um, can we have a list of these forbidden sub-configurations? So, I produced, you know, I gave you these, but I suspect you can construct some more. So, you have a list of forbidden subconfigurations. How big is the list? So, we will try to keep the list minimal, by which is meant that if you have this one, this is forbidden, we have shown. Then, of course, this one is also forbidden, it will never appear. We do not write that one because, you know, it is taken care of by some other stuff, smaller. If you can, if there is a configuration which is forbidden, but you can erase one uh, site and still keep it forbidden, then we erase that site and produce a minimal list. Minimal forbidden some configuration is one, if you erase anything, then it will become allowed. Is this point clear? Okay, very good. So, what is the list of minimal forbidden subconfigurations? So, sorry? The boundaries should not be zero. Boundaries should not be zero. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is allowed. You can construct ones which are boundary is not zero. Forbidden. Proofs are, yeah, for each one of these proofs can be constructed. The proofs can be constructed recursively. Start with a smaller one, this is forbidden. In order to produce this one, if I add something here, then it and it produces a forbidden one, then before that should have been a problem or some such thing. Okay. But anyway, let us try to produce a systematic way to check for forbidden configurations. Okay. So that method. So, the burning test is the following. You take the configuration you like, you are asking about.
and they look at all the sites and burn any site whose height greater than or equal to number of unburnt neighbors. Okay, burn means erase. So I will start with this three, two, one, zero. This site has two, right now all, all sites are unburnt, but this site has height three, but it has two unburnt neighbors, okay? This site has height three, but two unburnt neighbors. So it is burnt, by which is meant that I just erase the site. Now I look at this site. It has height 2, but it has two unburned neighbors. So this is also burnt. This one has two unburned neighbors, but height is 1. Sorry, I cannot burn this one. But I will come here. Now this has height 3, but two unburned neighbors. So it can be burnt. And this can be burnt, but this cannot be burnt. What about this one? Ah, I can burn this one because you know three, but it has at most three, and then this can be burnt, and so on. So you recursively apply this method to the full lattice. See, if at some stage everything gets burnt, then it, the configuration is recurrent. If at some stage something is not burnt, then it is forbidden. The, or then the configuration is not recurrent. So as a check, suppose somewhere or the other there was 0, 0. None of these two sites will get burnt because, you know, here it will say the number of unburnt neighbors is 1, but the height is 0, you cannot burn this one, the other one you cannot burn, they will stay put. Um, this one also, we, you check that if there is this configuration anywhere, under this burning test, it will not burn, they will just stay. This one cannot burn because it has height 0, but it has one neighbor. It has height 1, but it has two unburnt neighbors. So since all these sites in the f set are unburnt initially, none of them will burn. Okay? So the general definition of general definition of forbidden subconfigurations is that it is a subset of sites such that for each site height is strictly less than number of neighbors in F. So there is a, a subset F, which is a forbidden subset. You look for if all the neighbors in F are number of neighbors in F and the height is less than the number of neighbors in F, then that particular set is a forbidden set. Okay. Again, we can check, you know, um, that definition says this one is forbidden, this one is forbidden, this one is forbidden, and so on. Okay, just an automatic generalization. Right, uh, so, in this example, is it the final state which is forbidden or the initial state which is forbidden? Ah, so, the initial state is forbidden because it is not recurrent. It is forbidden to occur in the recurrent steady state. 
it was there in the original model, but in the recurrent state it will not occur. Okay, it is forbidden only in this limited sense. Uh, sorry. Yes, sir. So, the, the barring operation at any side is commutative. Yeah, very good. So, that is a good point. Yeah, so you can check or you can prove, verify that that is true. You can do this operation in any order and uh, you get the same result. So, you scan through the lattice. You know, I have this lattice, I check once, whichever I can burn, I burn. And then I do it again. And I do it again. If at some stage I find I am not making any progress, I did not burn anything extra in the new scan, then I stop and say that sorry, nothing is happening now, there is something remaining. If everything burns, then it is a recurrent state. If everything does not burn, it is a transient state. It does not matter which order you do it, how you do it. Okay? Yes, sir. Is there a mathematical proof behind it or is that the observation? No, no, no. It is a proof and I am giving you the, I am giving you the statement and I am telling you that the proof is trivial and you should construct it yourself. From the proof one leads to the statement or you start from the statement and then you do the proof? Of course, I give you the statement and you produce the proof. How one will come with this idea is a different question. Okay. I don't know. I, we, in, uh, I think this is how I came up with the idea. I started with this observation that 0, 0 cannot occur. Then I found that yeah, 0, 1, 0 cannot occur. Then the question was, what is the list of all possible forbidden configurations? And so, there is a list is infinite in principle for a big lattice. And so, then there was a question of characterizing the list. And this is not a very profound observation, but this strategy works. And uh, so, that is the answer. Okay, very good. So, this burning test, the way I have defined it here, is applicable for um, matrices where the toppling rules are symmetric, in the sense that delta matrix is a symmetrical matrix. If when the toppling occurs at this side, it transfers one particle here, when toppling occurs at this side, it transfers one particle here. If the matrix is unsymmetrical, then you have to modify the um, algorithm in some suitable way. Um, so, you have to work with directed graphs instead of undirected graphs and you have to distinguish between the in degree and out degree of a site. You know how many sites are there with arrows coming into this site which are of some type or some such thing and then the whole proof goes through. There is no particular difficulty. But just one has to realize that what we are calling number of unburnt neighbors will be modified in a suitable way if you have um, unsymmetrical bonds in the sense some bonds have direction, you can transfer one way but not the other way and so on. Okay? So, that part I will not do here. Uh, what we will do instead is to redo this test in a different way. So, this is multiplication by identity test. Okay. So, that, uh, so I still have my lattice and we have these equations a i to the power 4 is equal to a i 1, a i 2, a i 3, a i 4, where the notation is i, i 1, i 2, i 3, i 4, i 1, i 2, i 3, i 4 are the 4 neighbors of i. 
and there are n such equations. Okay? So, what I do is I multiply all these n equations and I get product over a i to the power 4 is equal to whatever is on the right. So, what now uh, suppose I work with the recurrent set, then a inverse is defined and if there are powers of a which occur on both sides, I can cancel them. Okay. So, what will I have left? Multiply everything, every side here will have power 4 on the left, we will have power 4 on the right. So, it will not show up, it will cancel out. Sides at the boundary will not cancel fully. So, you get so, this equation becomes uh, product over a corners squared over corners product over boundary a boundary equal to i. Okay. So, what that says, is this clear, this is just algebra. Yes, I will repeat. So, let us take a 3 by 3 pi, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and I want to multiply these equations for all these 9 equations and write down the answer. So, I will write down the answer a 1 to the power 4, a 2 to the power 4, a 9 to the power 4 equal to, what is the right hand side for this one? It will be a 2, a 4. What is the right hand side for the next one? This is 1, 3, 5, a 1, a 3, a 5. Okay? Write down all of those terms. And then you will see that a 5 will occur 4 times in the right and 4 times in the left, it can be cancelled. But a 1 will occur 4 times on the left, but it will occur twice on the right. Because once it will occur when you write this term and once it will occur when you write this term. So, it will 2 powers will be left. So, the answer is that uh, the final Tally of A's will be 2111211211211211 and 0 everywhere else is equal to 0, is equal to identity. But sorry, uh, to, to say that we can cancel on the left and the right side, yeah. we are supposing that it's just an inverse? Yes, precisely. So, okay. Just okay. For the state that I'm, that this I'm is only for the recurrent states. Okay. This will work. Okay. So for the recurrent states, he says that this is an identity because all these equations are true. This is an identity. So it says that if you take any recurrent state and you add this stuff to it, add two particles here, one here, one here, one here, two here, one here, one here, nothing in between, and then topple everything and see what happens you get back the original state. Okay. What is the proof? Well, if you add this stuff, then something or the other must topple. Otherwise, the whole thing is a, is a forbidden configuration. If it topples, you can check that under the relaxation process, every site will topple exactly once. When this site topples exactly once, this topples once, this topples once, this topples once, it gets two particles and four particles leave. And so, these extra two particles will leave. And here, this extra one particle will leave. And whatever is the starting configuration, you get back. Okay. So, this operator adding two here, one here, one here, is an identity operator on the recurrent configurations. 
and it is not an identity operator on the non recurrent configuration. So, you take your test configuration, apply this stuff, and if it um, relax, if you get back the original, then it was recurrent. If you do not get back the original, it is not recurrent. Yes, sir. But this test applies to any abelian model. Yes. I mean, uh, the critical number should be higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all these results are generalizable to other cases. We are just giving as a simple example that to the square lattice. Okay. So, that is called the multiplication by entity test, but it is exactly the same as the burning test. Why? Because I said topple is the same as burn. If this site I add 2 here, then what will burn? When will this site topple? You add this to C, the original configuration. If the original configuration had at least 2, then it will topple. And then in my criterion, I would have said burn it if the number of unburned neighbors is more than or equal to 2. So, it will burn. So, when a site can be burnt, it will be toppled in the multiplication test. Okay? And then it comes here, it throws a particle here, but this thing goes away. Under burning, the site is removed. So, then the number of unburned neighbors becomes less and the counting is different, but the test is the same. So, every time a site can be burnt, it is the same as every time it can be toppled. And if all the sites are burnt, and then you get the same thing as every site topples once. And so, you have the same test. Yes, sir. Hmm. Okay. But when it, the problem is a bit harder, how can you be sure that there is an inverse and how to define it? Which one? Like, I don't know, like the inverse. The, huh. Because in this case, you have AI, hmm. okay, there's, a, there's an operation, yeah. and you can define AI to the minus one hmm. okay, by saying that there's a complex hmm. series of operations. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. One is hmm. okay. But when the problem is a bit harder, like I don't know, there's no closed number of operations to go back to the Beginning. You okay. find a group that was one of the ah, so that is the transient configuration when the configuration is not inside this loop. Okay. So but in this case it's easy. Hmm. Uh, when the problem is not I mean there's no this configuration of No no no. So the mathematical proof is that on the set of recurrent configuration there is a unique inverse. Okay. And this identity holds. You know, we have proved that if you multiply with this, you will get back the original stuff. If it is not working, then you must not have been on the set of recurrent states. Okay. 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 So, that is the multiplication by identity test. Okay. So, next. So, all these tests have a generalization to the case of unsymmetrical um, piles. You know, you use the same algebra, then nothing changes. Multiply all the A's, put them together, you get something. That operation is valid for unsymmetrical matrices also, and everything goes through, there is no problem. Okay? Uh, the burning test is a little bit less sophisticated, so it does not work for unsymmetrical matrices yeah, automatically. So, you can easily produce counter examples where the burning test will not work, but this more general test will work. The reason being that in the equivalence which we showed between these two tests, everything has to topple once. <coughs> but suppose there is a site such that, you know, suppose I have a two site problem. And there is a delta matrix, which is the 7, minus 4, 2, minus 1. I can produce a matrix like that. It says that th this side, you know, it can have I 1 to 7 and whatever. Sorry, 0 to 6 and 7 will topple. It will send 4 things here. 
But if it sends four things to this site, this site has only and it topples and sends only two things out. Then if it other side topples once, this side topples twice. Okay? So in the corresponding equation, I will perhaps write this equation. So the equation was a1 to the power 7 is equal to a2 to the power 4, a2 to the power 2 is equal to a1. Okay? Now, um, if I want to apply the old method, I will square this equation and write a2, 4 is equal to a1 squared and then it will work out and everything will go through. But if I just multiply the equations without squaring it, then it may not work. You know, so there is a little bit of uh, trick or um, little bit of kink involved in the application. So the multiplication test is pretty good, it works more generally than the burning test. Burning test works for symmetrical matrices, but not for unsymmetrical matrices. Uh, what has been said in the past is that if you have greedy sites, which take in lot, lot of sites in one toppling, but get rid very few in each toppling, then the burning test by itself does not work and some variation of the burning test is required, which we will not produce. You can make it, you know, but we will not do it. It's not, uh, it's not the burning problem of the day. Okay, so now uh, equivalent equivalence classes of configuration. So the key result in the sand pile model which makes all of these things work is that under toppling, suppose you have a configuration ZI. It can go to some other configuration ZI prime equal to ZI minus delta IJ. Uh, yeah. If you topple at J, No, delta j i. Okay, so now I imagine this configuration space of Z, and so this is also a lattice in n dimensions. Z one, Z two, and all. Let us allow all possible heights, including positive and negative heights. And let us get rid of the toppling condition. The toppling condition is that you can topple only if the height is bigger than four, mm, three. We will get rid of. You can topple whenever you want. Okay, and we will also allow an extra thing, which is that you can untopple whenever you want. Untopple means the inverse of that toppling process, which says take one from each neighbor. Their height can become negative, I don't care, I just take it. Okay? So, given any point, you can topple at any site or you can untopple at any site. You get another configuration. And then you can topple at any site or untopple at any site, you get another configuration and so on. So, all the configurations which can be reached from a given configuration are said to be equivalent under toppling. Okay? They define an equivalence class. If you can go from i to j, you can also go from j to i. If you can go to i to j by toppling, then you can go from j to i by untoppling. Okay? So, two configurations z and Z prime are equivalent if they can be reached <coughs> f 
from each other by a sequence of toplings or untoplings. I guess this should have been called in toplings or whatever, but I mm, yes, it's called untoppling just now. Okay. All right. So now interestingly the key point is that still you cannot go from anything to anything. Okay. So the number of there are configurations you can go from here to there, but they, you cannot go from here to here. So, the number of equivalent classes is finite, not one. Yeah, sorry, yes. Okay, it is more than one. The number of equivalent classes is more than one. Okay, so how much is it? So, each stable configuration, each sorry, each recurrent configuration uh, belongs to some equivalent class because you can start with some configuration and um, suppose I start with this file, let us take and the heights are minus 5, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 5, 2, 7, 10. 11. So, very bad you know it has negative heights and very large positive heights, but I can make all heights positive by untoppling everywhere once. When I untopple here then I make this minus 4 and make this 9, but make this was minus 5 it has become minus 1. Then I untopple once more then it uh, will become plus 1 because two particles from outside will come in. So, when you untopple at the boundary you introduce particles from outside and so the number of particles increases and if you do enough untopplings at the boundary the number of particles will become positive everywhere and then you topple and get rid of them until the heights become less than 4 and so you will get into a recurrent state. Okay. So, from any configuration you can go into a recurrent configuration. Okay. Now, uh, can you have two recurrent configurations which are equivalent to each other under toppling? The answer is it is not possible. You cannot have two recurrent configurations which are equivalent, two recurrent configurations which are equivalent under toppling. So, we need to prove this one. Um, I can leave the proof as an exercise or I can do it here. Let me leave it as an exercise. It is not a big deal. You think about it for 3 minutes, you will come up with the proof. If not, you can read the proof in the notes, it is given there. Okay. So, let me skip the proof for the moment um, because I want to focus on something else. So, it turns out that in each of these equivalence classes, there is exactly one recurrent configuration. So, the number of equivalent classes is equal to the number of recurrent configurations. Yes, Could you explain again why each configuration is equivalent to a recurrent one? Because you take any configuration, you topple and untopple. By untoppling, you can make all the heights positive. Mm -hmm. When you make all the, then you decrease the height by toppling and it will go into a recurrent configuration. Because uh, if there is a configuration where every height is bigger than 4, then it can be reached from every recurrent from some recurrent configuration by adding and so then if you topple then you go back to another configuration which is still recurrent. Okay, so that is the proof. Okay. Yeah, no, so um, I think 
lot of these results are in the end very elementary, but you have to still convince yourself that you didn't miss out anything, which is important, but it is a um, sort of um, difficult for me to do everything on the board here, so I'm leaving some things as an exercise, yes. Sorry, but I still don't understand how by detecting any configuration, mm. we are sure that by with coupling and uncoupling, mm. No, you can reach, of course. You can uh, untopple everywhere. Uh, you know, so uh, topple everywhere 50 times. The, all the heights will become negative. That is not a problem. You can go to a configuration which is un everywhere negative or everywhere positive and so on and so forth. But you can also go to a configuration which is recurrent. And there is actually one unique recurrent configuration in each equivalence class to which you can go. Precisely. But they can be reached from a recurrent. Yeah, by untoppling and so on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the statement is precisely this that in each equivalence class, equivalence class, there is exactly one. Recurrent configuration. Okay. So the number of equivalence classes is also equal to the number of recurrent configurations. So now I want to count the number of equivalence classes. Okay, so what is the number of equivalence classes? So now we, it's a repetition of some old argument. So suppose there is a configuration. What is the other? This is I'm working in the um, zi space, d n-dimensional space of integer points, each of which labels a uh, height configuration. Okay, and zi can now go from minus infinity to plus infinity, all of them. So now this height, I can topple by delta 1 or delta 2 or delta 3 or delta n. That is a toppling process is equivalent to a translation in this by a vector delta 1. Okay? And there are n such vectors and all the sites which can be reached from a given site form a super lattice on this space. Okay, and uh, so then, uh, so set of equivalent points, equivalent points forms a, I, I think super lattice is the word which physicists use, so I am using it super lattice with basis vectors delta i. Delta i are just the row vectors of vector delta and the matrix delta. Okay. So now, um, can I determine the volume of the parallelopipede, volume of the unit cell in this problem. Yes. Just to confirm, I think so without going from one equivalent 
I don't know. They, we are working in n dimensional space yeah. and integer points in n dimensional space. Yeah. And I am making some equivalence between different points in the n dimensional space. Yeah. And they are connected by unit vectors, then they form. Okay. okay? So, then that is all there is. So, what is the volume of the cell in the super unit cell in the super lattice? Is the same determinant of mm, matrix formed by delta. So, the volume of cell volume of cell in this volume of the unit cell of the super lattice is equal to determinant of delta. the same argument. You, those are the basis vectors. You take the determinant, it gives you the volume. And now, of course, it is also an integer, no problem. And it is also equal to the number of recurrent configurations. So, the number of recurrent configurations is equal to determinant of delta. So, that is, I think, our uh, number of recurrent configurations. is equal to determinant of delta. And each appears with equal probability in steady state. Okay? So, now we have a full characterization of the steady state. We know which configurations are there, which are not there and what is the probability of each, each one is equal. So, now you have a, um, you know, you may like to ask something else like you know okay there is a pile in the steady state what is the mean height of the site at, at some particular site that becomes a problem you know okay i've given you a um, measure in the space of all configurations a uniquely well defined measure but now you have to find some averages under this measure that is often a hard problem you know like in most equilibrium state make problem that is what we do we find the measure uh, which is the Boltzmann measure, but calculating averages is non trivial. So, I guess the same thing happens here the measure is fairly straightforward, but given the measure if you want to find the mean height or you want to find the mean size of toppling or some such thing that may not be so easy. Okay, so, that is the work we have to do, but at least one step has been reached namely that we started with this problem at least the steady state is well characterized. After that uh, requires more work some of which can be done some other things cannot be done yet. So, that is a problem of you know I give you a model which is well defined like the um, um, Potts model or something or the other but I cannot calculate the critical exponent of the Potts model in three dimension or some such thing. So, that is a technical problem. It is important, but it is a technical problem which we may, may maybe we can address, maybe other people in the past did not manage and you can do it now or some such thing. Okay. Uh, okay so, what is the time now? Um, so, 15 minutes. Okay. Mm, I guess what we would like to do is to get some other rather easy results uh, which one can derive.
Okay. So let me define G I J is equal to average number of toplings at I given that I one adds a particle at j in the steady state. Okay, it is some kind of a measure of the amount of disturbance I create by adding a particle. How many toplings occur at side j when I add a particle? Um, how many toplings occur at i when I add a particle at j? Okay. So, I guess the measure is complicated. You know, you will have a configuration, there are lots of states and then uh, I will add something, it may topple, it may not topple and further toppling may occur, may not occur, all that kind of complication. I want to not worry about it. What I realize is that after all the toppling is done, on the average, every site has the same height as before. Under the steady state condition, that is by definition true. Okay? So, what happens is that in steady state, mass balance condition, says that inflow must be equal to outflow. Okay? So, we should have g i j 4 times g i j is equal to g i 1 j plus g i 2 j plus g i 3 j plus g i 4 j where we again use this i, i1, i2, i3, i4. These are the four neighbors. This is the num number of particles which f this is for j not equal to i. If I go to any other side i which is not equal to j, then number of things coming in must be equal to number of things going out. So, this is the number of things going out. This is the number of toplings at i. Each toppling throws out four things. How many things come in? On the average, I1 site will topple G I1 times and it will throw in G I1 things. And the I2 guy will throw in G I2 things. And so this equation is exact, it's just mass balance. Actually, this one does not use any of the toppling conditions. So it is valid for all kinds of sand piles, including the um, uh, non abelian ones. It's just a mass balance condition. Uh, I guess you have to put in the fact that exactly four things leave each time a toppling occurs, okay? Because that is part of this construction. Otherwise, I may not be able to do this mass balance exactly, okay? But once I put in this fact that exactly four things leave, then this condition is true. But when I equal to j, then g i i so, I will write, um, I guess more things leave um, than come in at the origin, because at the origin or at site i, uh, sorry, at site j I have added a particle. So, I have to take care of this fact and so I put in a delta i j and then I get rid of this condition. Okay. So, um, the G equation more generally satisfies the equation delta times G equal to identity and G as a matrix is equal to delta inverse. So, you write the Laplacian as a matrix, take its inverse that gives you the 
G matrix, which is now interpreted as the propagator, which is the average number of toplings at i when you add a particle at j. Okay. If I know the average number of toplings at i when I add a particle at j, then I can certainly calculate the total number of toplings when I add a particle at j by just summing over i and then I can average over j uh, if that is the way I was planning to add particles and I will get the average number of toplings when I add a particle. Okay, so, let us write that down. average number of toplings when I add a particle at random equal to g i j summation over j summation over i divided by n. Okay. So, that is not the once I have calculated g then this one is not much tougher to calculate. Okay. Okay. Yes. How uh, this scale working in the context of this recurrent state, I mean steady state can be any state or they have steady state is by definition the set of recurrent states with correct probability. The nothing else. So S G recurrent S G steady state will be a recurrent state. No, no, no. Steady state is a collection of recurrent configurations with suitable probabilities. Configurations are, inst you know, if you take a snapshot, that is a configuration. Steady state is a movie of the stuff in the um, long time steady state is not one snapshot, but it is a um, long time average of snapshots. Okay. I think that point is important to, yes, the notation, but the terminology, there is a configuration and there is a steady state. Steady state is not a configuration, it is a set of configurations with various probabilities. Okay. Okay, so this we can do, uh, maybe I should do it, I will do it, anything else I should do before. Uh, no, so let us do this first. No, I have other things to do, I will do this, but maybe tomorrow. Exact calculation of this g i j can be left as an exercise, but maybe I will take 5 minutes to do this on the board, it is not such a big deal. Okay. So, I will do it, but let us do something else uh, which was left over from previous um, lecture in the sense that in the notes it is done before the subsequent stuff which we will do later. So, in the notes what I have done, uh, which you know at, at when I was writing the notes I was organizing the material in some way and I thought that it was useful to put them in before then after. And so, right now I am doing it before then, uh, uh, you know I could do it in the eighth lecture, but I am doing it in this one. Okay, so, other models of SOC. So, the point is this, that Senpile model is a model of SOC. But it is not the only possible model you can make and there are other possible models one can study with equal justification. We study sand pile model saying it is a simple model to understand, but maybe there are other models which are also simple which we can equally well study. So, that should be kept in mind and whenever we study this in further you can see ask if similar things can be said for other models. Okay. So, let us discuss them. So, there was actually a um, interesting 
issue at one time, what is the simplest model of SOC? And um, various proposals were given and I think that is a personal opinion that the simplest model is this one. It's called loop erase random box. So first let us define the model that then we will understand how it is a model of SOC. So you can take, you can work in D dimensions but we are taking 2D. So there is a lattice, we are taking the square lattice, you can work with triangular lattice, whatever is your favorite and um, particle does a random walk, that is a very standard well studied model. So it takes a step to a neighbor with equal probability. Okay, so it mm, takes a step. We will remember how it took the step, then it went here, then it went here, then it went here and here. So the X, the only rule added is that if a particle comes back to a site which it has visited before, okay, then it has formed a loop. Maybe it comes like this. Then as soon as it forms a loop, that loop is erased. And so this is erased and it looks like this. Then it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and comes here. Then this loop is erased and then it goes and goes and then this loop is erased and so on. Okay? So what we have is a loop erased random walk. That is the name given to the problem. Uh, so what can one say about this one? Well, suppose you work on a finite lattice, L by L lattice. Then the walker will keep on walking, but we will keep on erasing loops. What is left at any time has no loops. So there will be a finite number of configurations. They occur with different probabilities. So there is a well-defined steady state. We will say, that the length of the loop, length of the walk is my measurable. It is the quantity I look at. And that sometimes I drive it by increasing it by one at each time step. But it decreases in random ways because sometimes some loops are formed, sometimes no loop is formed, sometimes a very big loop is formed, sometimes small loop is formed. And so the relaxation, the addition is addition of one length. The relaxation is the loop is erased and it occurs over different sizes. And there are some events with very big size, some events with very small size. And what is the probability that you will have a loop erasure of length L? The answer is that it's a power law in L. And it is a known trivial power law. Okay? So then that looks like a model of SOC you have produced a non-trivial power law starting with this very simple model, one particle walking around, okay, very good. So one of the problems which makes this, of course, Professor Ruhani has already said something about loop erased walks in his first talk. Maybe he will discuss it in some length later because, you know, that was uh, one of the things. But anyway, this problem is um, uh, well studied in various contexts, including even in conformal field theory, you can learn something about the properties of loop erased walks, their fractal dimension, um, the probability of loop of size L or that, that kind of stuff. But let us just say, that suppose I ask a simple question, what is the probability that you are at R at time t? Okay. So this answer is the same as in the, um, suppose you didn't erase the loops. You will still, the probability of being at R at time t is unchanged. So it's the same as probability of R t with no loop erasure. What is 
R t is the position at time t, R t is the position at R at time t. Okay. So, some properties of this system are immediately obvious, R squared average will go like t for example. for infinite lattice and it will go as L squared for finite lattice. Is the second result obvious? I have a finite L by L lattice and let us say the walk reflects when it reaches the boundary. Okay. Then it will be equally likely to be anywhere on the lattice at large times and so the R squared average will be L squared. I can calculate the exact probability. I can calculate the coefficient in front of this and so on. So, the problem is a tractable problem, but it has some features which are less obvious. In particular, the distribution of loop sizes is not so immediately obvious. So, it makes a good example of um, SOC. It has burst like events, it has slow driving, it, um, it has everything that we look for. Okay. Uh, so, this is called the Takayasu aggregation model. And so, the problem is defined like this. You take a um, again d dimensional space, but we will take one dimensional space. <coughs> d equal to 1 or higher. <coughs> sorry or higher and so the rule is that if you have a d dimensional space we add one particle at each side at every time step there is a discrete time step evolution you start with everything empty and you add one particle at each side at every time step and what th then what happens is that you add a particle and then each particle jumps to its nearest neighbor, one of them at random. So, there is it has three steps, one is addition of particles, and then there is a jump, each particle jumps to a neighbor. And then there is a third is um, aggregation. Aggregation says that if two particles jump to the same place, then they join up and then they never separate. They become a single particle of a mass 2. Then next time some mass will come and add to this, you know, um, 3. And then these 3 will jump together to a random neighbor and it keeps on going like this. I keep on adding one particle at each side and then this repeats. At each time step. So, what happens in this system? The ma total mass in the system keeps on increasing forever linearly with time. So, there is no steady state in the system. However, if I just sit at one side and I ask what is the probability that where I am now the mass is m. That mass distribution of masses actually has a probability distribution because there is some probability that you know this side of course this side the particle jumped out, but none of its neighbors jumped into this one. 
So there is a finite probability that just before the new particle is added, after all the jumps have occurred, after all the aggregation has occurred, the mass at this site is actually 0. Then there is a finite probability the mass is actually 1, there is a probability that the mass is exactly 2. So, you can calculate the distribution of masses at one point and it will be a non trivial distribution probability of m at a site at time t goes to p of m infinity which is a non trivial distribution which looks like this m this is probability of m and it kind of looks like this and there is a tail which as bigger times the tail becomes bigger and bigger because bigger and bigger masses become possible. Okay? But the beginning part does not change and if you keep m fixed and let t go to infinity you get a finite limit which is denoted by this and this quantity is a power law. Okay? So, this can be called to be an example of SOC. How can you call it an example of SOC? There is not even a steady state. Well, what you can say is that suppose I sit at one site, so I do not care what is happening everywhere and I will say that if something comes to me on my site with mass bigger than 100, then that is a big event that is like an earthquake. But if something occurs with some mass comes with size 200, then it is a bigger earthquake, right. So, if you choose any threshold, then there are some events which occur with bigger than that threshold and there is a power law distribution of sizes of these things and so this is a model of SOC, okay, yes sir. Yes. I would like to know that about the effects of this algorithm that the second one is that we are jumping the power part the particle jump yes from yeah. one side to the other side. Yeah. So why do we need it? Just randomly we are picking one No, side all of them. Side. All sides at all sides jump to neighbors. In okay. parallel. At okay. at one time step I add one grain to each side and next side every Mm, it, that grain adds to the existing grain and becomes a clump, it becomes a mass m and then the whole mass jumps to a neighbor and it happens at every site and then the mass is combined and then I add something and they jump again and then it goes on like this. So, this is an example of a system in with finite drive rate where the drive rate is finite because normally people study SOC with slow drive where the drive rate is really, really slow or some such thing. This is occurring at a finite drive rate and you still see these power laws which are um, some kind of signal. There are big events, small events and there is a power law distribution of big events. So, that is an example of um, interesting model of SOC. Uh, third model. It is called the train model. It is defined like this. Uh, there is a one dimensional track and there are train compartments. which are connected to each other by these couplings which are spring like. Okay? And uh, this one is called the engine and the engine moves with rate 1. So, every time step it, so there is a discrete lattice and so engine moves at rate 1, engine moves to right. So, the engine can move, what happens if the engine moves is of course, this spring will become longer 
and we say that the spring can be stretched but cannot be stretched too much. Once the length of the spring becomes 3, then it relaxes. Less than that, it does not do anything. There, there is the threshold relaxation. Okay? So, if length of spring is greater than equal to 3, it relaxes. Two, uh, a length which is 1 or 2 with equal probability. Okay, it can relax to this way or this margin. But once it relaxes to length 2, of course, it pulls the um, compartment behind um, to keep that length. Okay? But once this compartment is pulled, of course, this length will be stretched. But in it was initially 1 and this moved one unit, this become 2, then it does not do anything, stops. And then, uh, you know, but if this goes very far, then eventually the train just goes along. Very clear, simple model. So, what happens if, you, if this, this model, if you just study with single engine and no compartment? And that's a very trivial dynamics. Nothing happens. But suppose there is a compartment behind and that's all there is. Then x1 as a function of time will do this. Uh, it will go like this. It will evolve mm, discreetly like that. x2 will be initially here, then it will remain here, then it will jump and jump. Like that. Sometimes it stays put, sometimes it jumps by one unit, sometimes it jumps by two units. Okay? So, it is easy to analyze, it is not very hard. So, what happens if you have a train of length 3, or sorry, 2 compartments, yeah. Firstly, whatever happens to the second compartment does not affect the first compartment. First compartment will keep on going the same way it was going before. Now, you only have to study what happens to the second compartment. And it also undergoes this jerky motion and it turns out that uh, you can study this model in some detail now because of this um, reduction property that if you get rid of the third, com forget about the details of the third compartment, then the problem is easier to analyze. So, I start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 like that and then it turns out that if you look at the compartment behind, very often it does not move at all and then it moves in big, big burst and by a large amount and then it gets stuck for a long time and then it moves and then stuck and moves and it selects its movement is in bursts and the size of these bursts can become very big if that length of the train is very big. And so, it is an example of uh, SOC in the sense it shows burst like relaxation for compartments in the far back. Okay? So, it it is a tractable model of SOC and uh, seems to be an interesting model. It has been kind of studied by simulations and is not well understood theoretically. It cannot be analyzed fully for arbitrary lengths of um, train and so that is an interesting problem and um, oh, there was a number 4 which is actually called number 0 in the old one, which is called variance of sand piles. So, you can take other kinds of sand pile models with different toppling rules, you know, if the height is so much, then all height is equally distributed to all the neighbors, the height can be real numbers and not integers, um, the topplings can be stochastic, with some probability you do this, with some probability you do that, all those kinds of models can be studied and they are examples of SOC. The particular point about these first two examples is that they are actually 
turns out in the end that they are variants of S A S this abelian model which we discussed. One can show they are actually equivalent to it in some sense. So it's not immediately obvious from the definition, but uh, once you study it, once you analyze it, that you find that, oh, these models are the same. They are different uh, um, garbs, garments. You have the same person wearing different dresses. You know, so it, it's the same model, actually. I don't know about the third model, but it is perhaps also a variant of one of those models that has not been established. That is for you to show. Okay. Okay, so variants of St. Piles. I will stop here now. Okay. The attendance sheet. Can we have it back? Sometimes it is big, sometimes it is big.